I actually now think that sometimes when there's insecurities inside you that you don't um, face up to or own up to, it's really easy to just latch on to something external and start to make what you achieve in that external thing your like kind of validation for yourself. Mm. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Today's special guest is Dr. Janavi Shirali. Welcome, Janavi. Thank you, Stacey. I'm so happy to be here. I know. I'm so excited to have you here. So just really quick, I met Janavi through an RTT opportunity. It was an event that was hosted in New York City in November of 2021. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I went by myself. I don't really know anybody. I was newly graduating, but I just felt this calling to make the trek in. And, you know, you meet people and some people you click with and some people you just pass by and John V and I clicked like that. We really just hit it off. You can always tell when there's like a good energetic flow. We had dinner afterwards and it was just a really special night and we stayed good friends. So I thought she would be a great person to come on to the podcast because I was so intrigued by her own personal journey. So today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what brought her to become an RTT practitioner. I mentioned she's a doctor. She is a board certified ophthalmologist. And I just think it's really interesting because it's really not about the RTT per se. It's about her life's journey and how she found one thing to give her clarity. So welcome, Jonavi. Thank you, Stacey. So, Janavi, why don't you share with people a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm. You said my name perfect, by the way. So, um, yeah, it was so great to meet um, Stacy that evening. I went in alone as well, um, and it was just like awesome to meet other practitioners and um, really talk about what got us all there. Um, but yeah, speaking a little bit about what I do. So, uh, I have, I I guess I'm a, I'm a board certified ophthalmologist practicing. So I am actually a pediatric ophthalmologist. So I see kids and I'm an eye surgeon for children. And I have also trained in RTT, uh, last year. So I do that as well. So it's really interesting because in, both my jobs and they're really calling or, you know, the desire to serve or help or somehow impact another person's life, whether it's their vision, whether it's getting their eyes straight, like, or um, whether it's to, for them to get clarity in their own mind, which is what we do with RTT. So while they seem kind of separate, if you look at from the outside, it's actually to me all the same. It's just in different manifestations. But at the end of the day, if you have a problem with your mind, with um, like anxiety or struggling with things that you don't understand, or you have poor vision and you can't see well, those are both issues that affect and impact your life tremendously. And so I just love to be able to transform in both those areas. I'm having this major epiphany because in all the time I've known you, it never really occurred to me that you help create clarity for people, a clear vision, whether it's literal and physical or spiritual and emotional. And it's so amazing because I never put two and two together. So I love that. That is amazing. That's an aha moment for me right there at the very beginning. Um, It was actually, I I named my company um, that I started Seeing Your True Self. Mm. uh, Because to me, what we do with RTT is a vision and to, to see yourself in ways when you go back to your inner child and change like that energetic, emotional connection to like the events that happened in your past, but you're able to see them in a completely different way as you being like an empowered um, person, really an empowered and loved human being. 
So that's like your true self, you know? So, yeah. and, and we, you know, like when we go through RTT, like you actually see and experience yourself it, with that different lens. So, yeah. So that was, it just like came to me one day, you know, daydreaming, like seeing your true self. I was like, yes, that's exactly it. You know? I love it. So now when you and I, first spoke. So for people that don't know, I love to do like a pre-interview um, just so I can get a vibe for what it is that you would want to talk about. I always share with my guests, the purpose of the podcast is to really share people's journeys, that there is purpose in the pain and that there's meaning in every life experience. And it's usually the most challenging life experiences that we have that have the most meaning in our lives. And so when I asked you about that and I asked you what you would want to talk about, you brought up the concept of being a super functional, super high functioning person that nobody knew was actually super broken inside. And I was so happy you wanted to talk about that, A, because I didn't know that about you. And I think that's kind of the point. Right? right? Like you see the super high functioning person. We've seen this in the news a lot where you see people that are so super high functioning in the world. We just had this horrible tragedy with this Miss America back at the end mm-hmm. of last year. We watched Simone Biles crack under the pressure and everybody's expecting perfection and nobody's really realizing that sometimes it's the people on the outside that seem to be the most together and the most high functioning that are feeling the most lost. So would you be open to sharing a little bit about your journey with that and how the board certification really had an impact on your life? Sure. Yeah. And um, essentially, you know, throughout my life, like I have actually moved around a lot. So resilience and like getting used to new situations was something that just happened because my family, we literally moved every like three, four years. So new kid in the school all the time. And I'm an extrovert by nature. So, you know, like being that like bubbly, happy, like all is good, you know, that personality, I think, became, you know, that's just who I am. But at the same time, um, there were like continually, I think somewhere along the line, this um, studying, like academically pushing myself, um, you know, trying to like to get into med school or, you know, just going along that path felt all internalized pressure. Like no one was really pressuring me, but um, I actually now think that sometimes when there's insecurities inside you that you don't um, face up to or own up to, it's really easy to just latch on to something external and start to make what you achieve in that external thing your, like, kind of validation for yourself, Mm -hmm. right? So this is something, I mean, I've seen it with my clients too, that, like, you are actually like kind of insecure for multitude of reasons, but on the outside, you're like killing it at work or killing it at school. And it's because like, you're like pushing, pushing, pushing. Cause that's, that's what your worth seems. If that makes sense. Like well, that's where the value is in your right. worth. And do you right. feel like inherently you didn't feel worthy outside of that? Or was it just diminished Yeah, I think, and this is not just me, uh, you know, I think this low, true, I would say true self-esteem versus what it seems like from the outside. Um, I had extremely low self-esteem, which no one would probably know except my closest friends and family, like my sister or, you know, the, like my, my family. Um, And that came out in like disordered eating and body image issues and, yet this kind of yin yang of like who I am on the inside is, is someone struggling with so many things, but on the outside, I'm so confident. I'm so bubbly. I'm so happy. And, and, you know, mm-hmm. putting on that face. Um, and can I ask so, one question? Yeah. Cause there's a sentence I want you to fill in. If people knew who I really was, then. Then maybe they wouldn't like me. Yeah. And, and that's like the, um, the core of that like self-esteem, um, block, you know? 
Um, and yeah, so, so fast forward, essentially, you know, again, going through medical school, I think that process for a lot of people, including me was very challenging. I mean, the ed- studying is one aspect of it. Then you're also like in the hospitals, you're doing residency, the culture of medicine doesn't really make it okay to like take a day off or just take a day for mental health or wellness or, you know, even have time for counseling. Like none of that is really an option or was, didn't feel like an option to me at the time. So you just hit the ground, you just keep hustling, you just keep doing what you're doing and you show up for your patients and you do the next exam and the next certification and you just keep going. Um, And I think it all sort of came to a head uh, actually after I graduated. So after I had finished my fellowship um, at a children's hospital, had come back to New York to start my job. So again, on paper, like everything's amazing. I have a new job. I had gotten married like the year before, you know, we lived in New York, which was my dream. You know, everything is like check, 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 but I would just on the inside would be a totally different person. And what did the inside look like or feel like for you? So it would like, for an example, it would be like having a great day with friends and then coming home and just like breaking down and crying for no reason that I understood. Mm. Or like, yeah, going to work and like being a good doctor and, and, you know, doing the things you need to do and then coming home and like breaking down. So unfortunately my husband saw a lot of it. (laughs) Uh, One question I have is, and I wrote this down in my notes, it's this concept of what's wrong with me, because you were saying before, you know, in the medical field, it's go, 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 go. And it doesn't really feel like taking a break is available. It doesn't really feel like having the opportunity to seek support Mm -hmm. for mental health or wellness, because you are exposed to so much and you Mm -hmm. are helping others so much. Um, I know in my helping profession, even in the school I'm in now, they made us sign a contract of what is our self-care going to be and what kind of support do we have in place while we go through this journey? Because as you're helping other people so much, you must fill your own bucket and nobody's a greater helper than people in the medical field, right? So one question I have is, was there any comparative struggle happening in the sense that you're looking around, everybody else seemingly is high functioning like you, but assuming that they're not going down and having the breakdown because nobody's talking about it? Totally. I think that probably people are having similar issues that I was having, but no one talks about it. Mm-hmm. And when I actually, I remember my first Instagram post when I started my Instagram account, I had shared this story that I'll get to with the board certification. Um, people started messaging me like from med school and were like, I failed too, but I never said it to anybody oh or like God. felt the same way too, but I never said it to anybody. So thank you for saying it. And, and I was just like, wow, you know, that's crazy that that we all are actually going through similar things or not all, but, you know, a lot of us. And yet the the culture of silence and shame is just like so perpetuated that you're like, yeah, everything's fine. Everything's great. Um, I do believe that's changing now. I think there's um, a whole, uh, I think there's COVID has helped uh, and there is a movement and a culture and a community where you can find, um, you know, other like female physicians who want to talk, who who want to. Um, there's coaches like there. It's changing for sure. And I hope to be a part of the change as like a coach myself. Um, but, yeah, I think we're getting there. <laughs> so let's get to the board certification. Yeah. So it's, you know, it sounds, um, it's, it's basically like, imagine you've gone through like 13 exams and you just have to do this one last thing to, to like get the check mark that you're board certified and you can just be on your way and, and, you know, practice, um, in your career. And I had already completed part one, which was like a written part. And this part two was an oral part. And, 
when I got back, I had a study plan. I had a six month or like four or five month study plan. And I was like on it. I was doing the studying, but I was constantly crying. It was like, I was like studying and then crying, (laughs) studying and crying. And it was, and I just thought that's just how it is. And that comes back to like a belief that ended up, that I ended up kind of realizing was that I need to be struggling to be successful. So the Mm. harder I worked, the more tears were spent, you know, that meant like, I've worked so hard, I'm going to pass because look how miserable I am. So misery, so success has to be uncomfortable and miserable. Yeah. Like if you're having a good time, you're not, you're not doing enough. You're not working hard enough. Damn. Um, And honestly, then, so I went and I did the exam and I failed that exam. And that was, you know, one of the first, uh, actually, I mean, yeah, it was one of the first like major failures I had academically at such a later stage. Right. Um, And it was like devastating in some sense, of course, on my self-esteem and confidence. But by that time, I had already as soon as I did that exam and I came back, it takes about two months to get the results back. I knew that something had to change because I was so miserable. It didn't make sense. I was like, something is not right. And was the misery showing up as just constant crying and feelings that you couldn't control? Yeah, it was, you know, a lot of like irrational thoughts, irrational feelings, anxiety, just dissatisfaction. Um, And again, everything was good. If you looked at the Mm -hmm. outside, I'm like, what is wrong with me? Um, And that's when I actually did reach out to get help with um, from a therapist. And um, at that time, I was given that uh, sort of like a diagnosis, which was semi helpful called PMDD, which is short for premenstrual dysphoria disorder, which basically means that uh, it's like PMS on steroids. So for two weeks of the month, I was like more normal, my normal, like happier self. And then two weeks of the month, I would be like miserable, irrational, negative thoughts, feeling super down. And I just was like, okay, I guess that's what I have. And that means like, I'll just live with it. Um, but I, I did, you know, being proactive, like I, I was like, something has to change. So I did counseling. I started reading books. Um, that's when I came across the untethered soul by Michael Singer, which mm. you know was like a big aha moment. Like you are not your thoughts. Oh, okay. I don't have to listen to that crazy voice going on in my head. I call it the itty bitty shitty committee. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just like the worst of the worst, the inner critic right. on steroids. Yeah. Um, and, and all of that, helped, you know, it helped a lot. It helped me understand myself. So by the time I got the results of the exam, I was like, not really surprised because I had already started understanding, like, if you have so much negativity going on inside, like, how can things be positive on the outside? Um, But I think the single best thing I did at that time was to re-enroll in the exam in about three months which was really scary because I was like, maybe I should just do it next year. Maybe I'm not ready for it. Um, But I, you know, I got advice from a few trusted people and they were like, just get back on the horse. Like you've already put in the work. Um, So I re-enrolled in the exam and the different, the one thing I committed to myself was I am not going to do this miserably. Like I will study, I'll set a time table. Like I used to wake up at five 30 and do like two hours of studying in the morning. But when I checked off my daily, whatever I had said that I would do, the rest was free time. So I was like, I'm going to enjoy my life. I went to my dad's birthday in Toronto. I went to best friend's wedding. I did the things I I never would have done before. Right. Would Um, you have avoided things like going to events like that? Yeah. I would have been like, it's exam time. I'm not going. You know, mm. this is lunchtime. Um, but this time I was like, nope, I'm doing this a different way. And whatever the result will be, will be. But I'm like focusing on my like mental health first. Um, and that's when I kind of started calling it 
to myself the happy way, which is also like why I called my Instagram account your happy doc. Like it's, and I use it literally to this day to any hard thing that's coming up. I'm like, okay, there's two ways to do this. There's like the crappy way, which of course I do for the first couple of days. Then I (laughs) (laughs) definitely, I don't jump on the happy train right away. It's like, let's be honest. Right. Let's just put that out. (laughs) Um, First, there's the very sad way for a bit. (laughs) And, And then I'm like, okay, so are you done now? you know. Right. And don't you feel like that's a little bit of just like sticking with what's familiar? Yeah. And even though you promote the happy way, and even though you're familiar with the happy way, it's not necessarily fully familiar all the time. No. And we're human. And like, we want to go to like, like negativity or victim mentality or like, why me and all of that. That's your first response, which like it makes sense you're human so what so how did you get from well let me ask you this did you did did you pass the second time you took it okay but you did did. it happily you did it the happy way and it it was a huge um it not not of course I was so happy that I passed but it also gave me faith in living life like in this different way which now that's like three that was in 2018 that's something now that I have to practice and I do practice like on a daily basis. Um, And I, yeah, I mean, I haven't even gotten to RTT piece of this. Well, that's what I was curious about. Good segue. Like how did you get from that to being this coach of clarity, this doctor of clarity, like going, continuing to be a board certified ophthalmologist and also being an RTT practitioner, how did you come across that? Yeah, so that um, I essentially for like a year and a half had gotten to this like pretty okay level with the whole PMDD. I was understanding it. I was doing, you know, coaching and I was like, okay, I just have to live with it. That's that's the bottom line. Like there's no medication or the ones that were suggested I didn't want to take, you know, on and off. And even therapists or like even coaches were like, you just have to like, you know, be aware and present with your emotions when it comes up. Like a lot of the conscious work that we, you know, learn and teach now, um, like being aware of your emotions and all that. And I was like, okay, great. I guess that's what I'm doing. Um, it still wasn't fun, you know, two weeks of the month, like being aware of the <laughs> shit show that was coming up. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I was like, you know, now I'm so much more in tune. Like I can ignore it. I told my husband like two weeks of the month, like don't really listen to anything I say. Out. <laughs> like ignore me. Um, until I essentially heard this podcast um, by um, by Natalie Ryan Hebert, who's like one of the amazing RTT practitioners who specializes in PMDD. And she just had this podcast where she talked about how PMDD is actually um, like subconscious trauma or, or like she calls it like a box of pain. And it's that box of pain that when your hormones change premenstrually, the, the veil thins on the box of pain. And then that all that comes to the forefront. And then when your period's over, you know, that veil like gets back to normal and the box of pain gets hidden away and you continue on. And that really resonated with me because I didn't understand like what I was like, I don't have a box of pain. I mean, my childhood was like really good. I don't understand. There's, I don't have any deep hidden trauma that, um, that's coming out that I could think of consciously. Um, but at that point I was like, you know what, I'm willing to try anything. And so when she started talking about the subconscious and, and how, all of this is like stored in your subconscious. She could have said anything, frankly. And and I was just convinced to try. It's like eating it like chocolate cake. You're like, I'm picking it all up. Yeah. And it's delicious. Yeah. I mean, Tell me what to do. Exactly. So I just took a leap of faith in RTT. I had never heard of it before, but what she said and, you know, compelled me. 
Um, I was still like fairly skeptical as like, I don't know what this is. I'm making an investment in something. I have no idea. It's not, you know, um, evidence based and, you know, all the scientific things that I know and, uh, and like kind of learn and follow all the time. But again, I think just being at a spot where I was willing to try and I was open and it's honestly a little part of me at that time, there's something like that inner voice that was like, just do it. And I wonder where this is going to take you. It just, it wasn't in my mind at all to go into RTT at all, but I was like, let, I want to do it for myself at least. And I did her um, program and I, um, it was like two RTT sessions and uh, and some like co group coaching with that. And the in about, I would say like three, four months, I didn't have PMDD anymore, which is like, I mean, it was life, it was life changing. Okay, so I yeah. need to stop you and, and you can just go as deep with it as you want mm -hmm. or not. But you know, when I talk to people as an RTT practitioner, they're like, I don't get it. And a lot of it is just like you, like, I don't have a box of pain. I don't have childhood trauma. Yeah, fine. I'll agree. I'm stuck. My anxiety is yeah. off the charts. I'm constantly walking around in a state of panic. I don't even recognize myself, but my childhood was fine. Right. So there's nothing wrong with me. Yes. So I'm going to ask you, what did you learn? Because for people that don't know about RTT, basically it's pretty simple. You mm -hmm. know, you have somebody that is skilled at getting you into such a relaxed state that relaxed state can be known as hypnosis. You're basically into a brainwave state where like your conscious mind is just super sleepy mm -hmm. and your subconscious mind is just more in the forefront and more aware, right? You're awake, but you're tired. You're kind of groggy. Your eyes might be closed. Mm -hmm. But you're really just super relaxed because your conscious mind is not the chitter chatter. It's just quiet. And now we can tap into talking to the subconscious mind, which is where all of our emotions lie. And it's also where all of our core beliefs come from. Mm -hmm. And for people that don't know, our core beliefs are typically formed before the age of eight. So experiences that you've had early on in your life that made you feel a certain way. And caused your brain and your mind to create beliefs to support that. It's always doing something in benefit of you in its opinion, right? If it has its own opinion. The problem is, is once we create that form of belief, it's like a thin veil that really filters the lens through which you see everything, see mm -hmm. yourself, see everybody around you. This is why two people can be in the same exact circumstance and have very, very different thoughts and approaches to it because their lived experience is different and their lived experiences cause them to have different core beliefs, right? So mm -hmm. what did you learn about yourself in that process that you could then see clearly was causing the filter, that right. was causing all of these challenges. Yeah. And, you know, the, so what I basically learned through the RTT was a kind of a very, very deep um, sense of deep, I would say, core belief of a self rejection. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't even know that consciously. And that's why it didn't make sense because when that box of pain came out, like with the hormones premenstrually, none of the thoughts that I was having made sense to me, to like the normal conscious Janabi. You know, they were very, like, there were a lot of jealous thoughts. There were a lot of like self hating thoughts. Um, at some point, I think I was like, I just don't want to be myself. And it, and if you compare th those thoughts to the thoughts of like the two weeks later, they were like incongruent, you know? And that's so what did I, you I, learn that would have made more sense to the, you know, John of you didn't recognize in those two weeks? Right. What did you learn in that session that might have actually been congruent with it? So, yeah, I mean, I I won't go into like super personal details about, because that it's, it's like yeah. really from from childhood. Um, but it's again, it came down to like that core belief of um, of like like a a very strong self rejection that, mm. and 
again, when you look at how it came to happen, it's like, again, no one's fault. You know, I was in a very loving um, childhood with like very loving parents, but it's just seemingly small circumstances or um, small events that happen. And honestly, I don't even, as a practitioner now, I don't necessarily like pinpoint, oh, that event is what caused it. It's more the belief, you know, that event that shows up in your session, that's just, um, that's a representation or like, that's like one moment in time. It's one example. It's one example, but then the the main the most important thing i learned out of that was that wow like i the at subconscious level there was such a deep level of belief of self rejection and that's where all these thoughts were coming from and the beauty of rtt is not only can we get to that belief but we are able to as i said before reframe it and mm-hmm. see it in a different light and boy when you do that it's like that aha moment of like, oh my gosh, like I am worthy. Like I am loved. I am enough. And then of course, listening to the audio for 21 days, like rewires in that, um, those beliefs in such a strong way. Like it sounds so simple because it is simple, but it's also just one of those experiences that you can only, once you go through it, do you understand the the powerful impact of it? A hundred percent. And it's because it's all subconscious and it's because no matter how much I would have thought about it, I would have never got to that belief at a conscious way. Like it just wouldn't happen because I just didn't know any of those things. Yeah. So a couple of things are coming to me. Number one, I've been using this analogy the last two weeks with, um, you know, potential clients, people who come to me with a discovery call that are really stuck that might say something very similar to yourself of like, there really probably isn't anything you can possibly unearth if we were to do an RTT session, because I don't have anything significant that Mm -hmm. happened in my life. And this analogy keeps coming to me, which is it's not going to look like a thunderstorm or a tornado or a hurricane or a tsunami. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's little raindrops, little raindrops yeah. that have happened over and over and over again that kept validating something you once believed. And I said it could be as simple as um, going, you know, being in first grade and raising your hand and getting something wrong and a bunch of people left. Mm-hmm. or out on the playground in fourth grade and you got out there late because you ran to the bathroom between lunch and recess and now all the, these groups are formed and everybody's, they're kids, they're egoistic. Nobody's stopping and thinking, let me pull this person in and now that person's making a core belief, I'm not worthy or right. I'm not enough. Mm-hmm. And then because they had that fleeting moment, now they're seeing everything else that day through that lens. It's that comparative bias, right? You see it right. all, the confirmation bias, right. sorry. You, you see it all the time. Yeah. It's yeah. like when you know you want to buy a Tesla and everywhere you look, you're like, oh my God, they're everywhere mm-hmm. because you're just on the lookout for it. Right. Right. And so when I'm able to explain that, because people get somewhat, curious yet Mm -hmm. somewhat concerned when they hear the word hypnosis within RTT or what have you. And it really is just so important for them to understand there's really no harm in going in and giving it a look. Mm -hmm. Because the way I also share it is, you know, back in the day, I was born in the 70s. You were probably born in the 80s, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. But still, at that time, there was no computer. There were no electronic databases. We had card catalogs in the library. Mm -hmm. And I always say to my clients, every single experience, even the ones you don't remember, they're filed away in this card catalog. Yeah. And when, when you're in that really relaxed state, I basically am speaking to your mind. I want you to serve up a vital, vivid, crucial time that has to do with X. And it's almost like the subconscious is like, okay, give me a second. Yeah. And it just pulls up anything. And like you said, it's just one example. And sometimes my clients were like, whoa, that was, I don't even, I mean, they kind of remember it, but they didn't see it as impactful 
Mm-hmm. They would have never aligned it to the circumstance. Right. But once they're able to see it in hypnosis, and Marissa says this so well, understanding is power, but understanding in hypnosis is the most incredible power. Mm-hmm. And it really is. That knowledge is so much more powerful because it's so much more concrete. Right. And then yeah. you can go back and be like, but that that's not going on anymore. Mm-hmm. And I know better now, right? When you know better, you can do better. I love it. I love the fact that you're talking about how an unresolved emotion, like feeling rejection, could manifest itself physically. Because I don't know about you as an RTT practitioner, but how many people I end up working with that are coming to me because they're having emotional challenge, but they're also sharing with me at that moment, I also have horrible inflammation in my body, or I have acid reflux, or I have IBS, or I have rash from head to toe, or whatever it is. When, you know, there's a book I have here, um, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. Mm -hmm. Right? The emotions we keep, our body weeps. So if we're not able to address it, it can manifest physically. But Mm -hmm. you can't, like you said, you can address it consciously. But each person I've worked with, it's like, wow, I've been going through therapy all these different years. I've never been able to get to this. Right. Because when you're working with a therapist, and I've worked with 25 years worth of therapy, like I have nothing against a therapist. I think therapists do amazing work. But unless you're working at your subconscious, you might end up in that loop where you could talk it out till the cows come home. Yeah. And actually one of the clients I had recently, she told me um, the session that we did unlocked such a big part of her and made her so much more open to therapy that now she's getting so much more out of therapy, which was amazing because, you know, again, I I know I'm not a, a licensed mental health professional. I'm not you know, trying to be, I love working in the subconscious space. And if I can unlock something subconsciously for a client and they go on to do therapy and this, she's not the first person that told me this. I mean, that's fantastic. Agreed. It's like amazing. So just to be a part of that journey, even for someone else is, is amazing. A hundred percent. I always say it takes a village and you have to meet the person where they are. Right. So if we are a part of that journey, fantastic. If you want to be with me for the whole journey, fantastic. It's not for me. It's not my ego at play. I don't do it for the recognition. Right. We do it because we we want people to feel the peace we were able to gain. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I got in to this, I I got into RTT because I found out about it much later, but I had my first hypnotherapy session 10 years ago. And at that point I was 40 and I was so stuck and I had been so stuck for decades. And I had been through, I can't count how many different counselors, therapists, Mm -hmm. psychiatrists, everybody consciously, honestly, they would be like, you're fine. Like, not that you're fine, but like, you've got it. Yeah. But my body did not think so because I felt like I had an acela train running through my chest 24 7. Mm-hmm. My stomach was always upset. My chest was always a flutter with what I'm going to term here as anxiety, but now I know is just a massive surge of energy in my body when things are off and I'm not in alignment, mm-hmm. right? My blood pressure was all over the place. All these different physical things were happening, but I understood what, like, yeah, I unconsciously I had my shit together, mm-hmm. but my body was not caught up. And it wasn't until I finally went to a, a coach that was a clinical hypnotherapist. She didn't do RTT. I didn't even know about it at the time. And that session shifted everything for me. That's awesome. Everything for me. So when I opened my coaching practice about six months in, when I was hearing the same thing from all my clients, mm-hmm. I just, I wish I understood why. Mm-hmm. I just wish I understood why. It, very similar to your story. I feel this way about myself, but I present in this way. Everybody thinks right. 
I'm X, but I know I'm really Y. Why don't I see myself the way everybody else sees me? Why am I always so depressed? Why am I having issues with intimacy? Why do I have a low self-esteem? All these different things. And I kept thinking, you know, I really got to the root cause of my why with that hypnotherapy. Mm -hmm. So I was in a Mind Valley uh, intake, you know, I was doing a coaching quest through Mind Valley and I came across Marissa's work and I was like, no, that's something I can get behind. Mm -hmm. And that, and it really has been a game changer for my clients. Yeah. Because now I can help them get to that root cause. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, again, doing it as a client and then making the decision, it it was just me following like my heartstrings yeah. you know, at the time because I was, you know, I'm, I work and I love my work. And, um, but I think there's a part of me that likes to diversify and likes to, you know, do different things and do different modalities of healing. So when I, did RTT as a client, um, I just had that thought, like, you know, I had the thought, like, I can do this. You know, I can do this for other people. I found it really appealed to, like, there's something very subjective about it, but there's also something very objective and very um, methodical about it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, And I love that we also focus on the positives and the empowerment and like where you want to go. So we're not just talking about like your trauma or the anxiety or the insecurity, but we're spending half the session or more talking about, you know, who are you without all this? Yeah. And and that's a tough question for a lot of people to answer. Right. But that's I mean, that's what I just love and about RTT. And when I ended up taking the training and all of that, it was so much more clear, like, yeah, like this, I definitely want to, you know, I I can do this and I like love doing it. And did you approach that training the happy way? I did for sure. (laughs) For sure. Let me tell you, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was great. It was really awesome. Um, fun and I didn't put any pressure on myself. I too. love it. Well, I just put your website up, but I want people yeah. to hear it in case this ends up in the podcast first. It's www.janavishirali.com. Mm-hmm. And um, you have an amazing website. I went and checked it out. And I think it just really explains to everybody how you can help them on their healing journey. So for people that are really, you know, attracted to, Janavi's story, her experience. Maybe you've had a similar experience. Maybe you just vibe with her. You definitely want to check out her website. And then at the bottom, you can see her Instagram. And is your Instagram and your Facebook the same? No, I have my Instagram um, and my website. My business Facebook is still sort of to be TBD. Like, okay. Uh, but your Instagram yeah. is amazing. I've seen you do some group meditation on there, um, which really inspires me to do something quite similar. So, and you're always providing such useful, educational, inspirational content. So for people that want to check out John v, you want to go to at your underscore happy doc on Instagram yeah. and it's her website is her name. It's www.janavishirali.com. So listen, I love to end with asking a question about books because, you know, the service we provide, it's not free. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are not in a position where they're ready to take a leap um, or they can't take that leap. And so I love to offer free resources. So one question I have for you is books were always a great free resource. Podcasts were always a free great resource for me when I couldn't afford the, the extra support I was seeking. What's been your favorite book or what's been a book that you just couldn't imagine not having been a part of your healing journey? So I I mentioned it already, but it's the Michael Singer book on the untethered soul. Yeah. That was like very foundational for me. And to date, when I start veering into the, the sad way. <laughs> I will pull that out. The unhappy way. The unhappy way. The unhappy way. Um, 
And I will pull that out and sort of like get back to like 101, basics 101 of, you know, what triggered like trying to live a different way. Um, I also think in terms of free content, um, YouTube is actually amazing. Like no Eckhart doubt. Tolle has these short clips and videos that you can just listen to quickly. So I love those. Um, I'm going to shout out um, Glenn Ambrose. He's a life coach and he has a podcast uh, that I don't remember the name of it, um, but um, he his podcast is excellent as well. And he kind of talks about living like uh, a, the happy way, I would say. I love it. And I think also Marissa's YouTube channel is yes. chock full of content. That's Marissa Peer. I guess it's one R, one S, P E E R. Mm-hmm. Um, but hers is really, really good too. I, my favorite book right now, because if people know me, they know I'm kind of stuck in this like trauma jam. I'm not really stuck in it. I'm putting yeah. myself there because I'm so freaking obsessed. I'm obsessed with learning it so I can educate people why they're stuck. Mm-hmm. Right. So right now I'm reading and trying to finish, it's heavy. Um, the Body Keeps Score. Mm-hmm. And for anybody that's generally interested in how the brain works and what happens to the brain in trauma and why people are stuck, it's a bestseller. I, I, and it's just amazing. So that's my free resource for the day. Awesome. That's on, I, I have it in my Kindle mm. reading list, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Yes. My, my, my uh, podcast microphone here is standing on a stack of books. So what do I have here? I have um, How to Do the Work by Nicole LaPera. Yes. Phenomenal, yeah. holistic psychologist. I have Tell Yourself a Better Lie by Marissa Peer. And then I have the two books I already mentioned, Feelings Buried Alive, Never Die, and The Body Keeps Score. So I always love to give people some extra resource. So this has been amazing. I could go on all day, but I have to take my niece and my son to the city. I'm going to be in your neck of the woods. I'm actually going to the city today, too. Oh, where are you going to be? Uh, Upper East Side. I'm just going to stroll around. (laughs) Fun. I'm going to be in Lower West. I think we're going to go down by Chelsea Pier, uh, down to the village. My son wants to hit a store that he really likes, and we're going to go look for some greasy fries. That's his goal. (laughs) So, all right. This has been amazing. Thank you. As always, people can catch this on the replay um, right here on Facebook. It's also live on YouTube. And I have an amazing podcast manager now named Kelsey, and she's helping me strip these bad boys and get them into the cast universe. You can actually start to find my old podcast series, which is called Strong as a Mother. We are blowing that all out and it should be available in the next week. You can find it wherever you find your podcast. But in the meantime, enjoy this one, leave your comments, and we will be happy to respond to them. Take care, guys. Thanks, Stacey. It's awesome.